This happened two summers ago. While I was house sitting out in California for an older couple that I had met at a conference for work. It had seemed like a dream scenario. The couple wanted a vacation in Hawaii for two weeks, but didn't want to board their cats. And I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again, where they happened to live. Because I had loved it the first time that I went. And we figured that we could mutually benefit if I came out and I house sat for them. So, I flew out there, and they showed me around for a few days, taught me how to care for the cats, and there was two of them. One that was extremely shy and that I barely saw, which is important later. And their plants. They gave me access to their house and cars, and these people were very generous. And before I knew it, I dropped them off at the airport and I was on my own. At first, it really was the dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland and making forays into San Fran, Sonoma, Monterey. In the mornings, I could just walk out the front door and shortly be hiking the pass surrounding nearby Mount Diablo, and I was just ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I had actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate there even. But then one day, about halfway through my final week there, when I got back to the house I felt really odd. Almost like I shouldn't go inside. But I shook it off and I went inside anyway. It was getting late and I needed to put out dinner for the cats. Once I was inside, I forced myself to ignore how off I felt. And I made some food for myself and went to bed. And was shocked to find the shy cat hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time that I had even seen her up close. The entire time that I had been there up to that point... She never left the house bedroom until she didn't realize that I was around. Again, I ignored the weird feeling and just assumed that she had decided I was okay and went to bed. I did start locking my bedroom door at night though. I also remember that about halfway through that night, I thought I heard someone walking around in the gravel outside of my window. But after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else and I went back to sleep. The day after in the morning, I still felt a little odd, but I kept up with my plans for the day. I drove out to a little music festival in Sonoma and went clothes shopping, and overall I had a great day. When I got back to the house though, I found the front door locked in a way that I hadn't left it. Basically, my host never locked the deadbolt, only the lower second lock, and that's the only lock that my key worked on, so I never messed with the deadbolt but it was definitely locked. So, I had to call my host and find the hide key, which, to their credit safety-wise, was buried like a whole foot underneath the bush outside, and had definitely not been on Earth for a long time. So, I used that when inside, and I kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did, but with a different door. This time, I had stepped out into the garage to get a drink, and when I turned around to go back into the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key in that door, but I was still pretty bewildered. My own cats are whack, so I think in my mind I was trying to come up with a way the cats could be locking me out of the house, but I was coming up empty. I decided I must have been misunderstanding how the locks worked, and I just wrote it off and started checking and triple checking locks when I went out of the house or out into the garage. That night when I went to bed, the really awful feeling of unease was still there, and so was the shy cat, who was clearly unhappy to see me, but also wouldn't leave my room. But again, I just locked my bedroom door and I went to sleep. The next morning, I felt awful. Nausea, body aches, I had no desire to leave the house, so I decided to stay in and watch Netflix for the day. This vacation stay was like a full two weeks, so I didn't feel like I was in any hurry to get all my touristy things in anyways. But as the day went on, I started to feel that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into the feeling of being incredibly watched. Around mid-afternoon, I got to the point that I was so uneasy that, even feeling awful, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. 
I was getting a bit low on food, so I went to the grocery store and bought a couple food items that I didn't think would hurt my stomach. And as I started to leave the checkout, the cashier said the generic, Have a great evening. And I just instantly started crying, shocking myself and the poor cashier. Because I just had this intrusive thought that said, You might be the last person to ever say that to me. When I got to my car, I was still crying and my entire body was telling me not to drive back to the house. I couldn't not though, because I didn't want to neglect the cat, so I drove back, parked in the driveway. Then I convinced myself after about half an hour to just go and open the front door. Once I did that, I thought I would just get over with it and be able to go in and at least feed the cats. And then maybe I would go get a hotel room after but my body physically would not let me inside. It was like I was stuck in the entryway. And then I made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house saying that I had already called the police and that they were on their way. In panic logic, I figured that would make anyone in the house leave. So I faced the inside of the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms. And I did just that. The second I had finished saying, they're almost here, so if you want to avoid being arrested, you need to leave now. The light in my host's room turned on, and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to the car, called the police for real, and proceeded to have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. Once they got there, they checked the house and didn't find anyone. But the double doors in my host's bedroom were left wide open. I'm so glad the cats didn't get out and there is a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds, so they said it looked like someone had been there. What makes it so scary to me is that nothing was taken, and that based on the shape of the house, that would have been the perfect vantage point to see me in the living room as I stayed home sick. And to explain this, the house was in an L shape, and from the windows into the garden that were in my host bedroom, you could see into the living room windows. Also, the minute the police were gone, they said they couldn't prove anyone was there. There were no signs of forced entry, and we couldn't get a hold of my host immediately to verify if anything had been taken. Once they did get back, they verified that nothing had been taken. So they said they would patrol a bit, but nothing else. The shy cat was right back in my host's bedroom, and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home. So basically, I think the intruder had been there at least two days, forcing her to choose between two strangers, and leading her to choose the one that was at least a little less strange, me. It messed me up pretty bad, especially because they didn't catch the person, and didn't seem to have any desire to lock, and I still had to stay in that house for the next three days. Nothing else odd happened and I didn't feel anything off the rest of the time that I was there, but the damage was done. I've never felt completely safe in a home without doing a complete search before bed since. But I am extremely glad that my gut spoke up. I guess I would rather have some residual anxiety than be dead. So, whoever was in my host's house watching me, let's please never meet. When I was in 7th grade, my parents decided to take a 3 week long summer trip to Europe. Most of the vacation was amazing. After all, I was a child in a different continent, and some people never get the chance to travel ever. But while I was in France, some things went down that I have thought about for years and it still gives me chills. We were staying at a pretty nice hotel. I don't remember much except sharing a room with my little sister, and my parents sharing the other. But one night, my parents went out to eat and said that I should take my sister into the hotel's indoor kids area for an hour, and then go back to the room. And so I did that. While at the play area, I watched my sister, obviously. Other people were there, mostly adults, all of whom I assumed were watching their children. But at one point, one of the aforementioned adults started talking to me. A brown-haired man, who simply looked like your average Joe and didn't seem menacing at all. I just thought that he was trying to make conversation with this weird girl sitting alone at the kids' play area, so I talked with him. Basic stuff at first, how I like traveling and where I came from, 
And then it got a little more personal. How old I was, where were my parents, was another sibling with me? Whenever he asked these questions, he would take out his phone and slightly point it at me. But being a dumb middle schooler, I didn't stop talking or leave. We had been talking for around 20 minutes and I noticed that it had been around an hour or so. I said bye to him and I went to get my sister. I get her and I leave the area. But out of the corner of my eye, I see him pull out his phone and point it dead straight at me. Even at 12, I could realize something was out of whack. So I booked it as fast as I could back to the hotel room. When my parents got back, I didn't tell them of the incident because I didn't want to hear a lecture on a stranger danger. Besides, I thought I had seen the last of Mr. Creeper. But I was not that lucky. A different time when I took my sister to the play area, I saw the same man. I wasn't too worried. There were other adults around, so it's not like he could kidnap me right then. I still wanted to avoid conversation though. He started talking to me again, addressing me by my name which somehow made the whole situation even more uncomfortable. I talked with him though, until he asked me what my room number was. I said that my parents said I shouldn't tell other people my room number, which was true. But I mainly just didn't want this weirdo to get my room number. He said that a rule like that only applied to strangers, and that me and him were not strangers. While he said this, he was touching my shoulder, which made me want to scream. It's funny he said that we weren't strangers because I then realized that I was the one giving all the personal information. I don't even think he told me where he came from. He said his name was Paul, but that name was so generic that he could have been lying, which he probably was. Those thoughts triggered me to say that I had to go. I was late to see my parents. I grabbed my little sister and I ran to the hotel's front desk, scared that if I went to my room, the man would follow me. I told the people at the desk the description of the man and where he was. They told me to go to my room and that they would take care of it. I went back to my room where my parents were waiting and I told them all about it. We left on a train a day early. I wasn't alone for the rest of the trip. So, a few years ago, my boyfriend's dad's family decided to get together and all chip in to rent a condo in Ontario. There is a big extended family over there that his dad never saw, because he only really got along with one of his three sisters. My boyfriend's mom had talked him into going though, and they let me tag along because I had been around long enough that they liked me and they trusted me. I can't remember where everyone else had gone. I think it was to the beach for like the third time that day. It was just my boyfriend and I at the condo because we were kind of sick of the beach and just wanted to do nothing in the shade for a while. We were sitting outside, looking over the water and just kind of talking about life. I had just finished reading the Harry Potter series so we were kind of talking about that. When this woman comes out of the brush beside the condo. Just for an idea, this condo was about an acre of land, maybe, and it was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. The front of the condo was probably 70 feet from a dirt road, no one traveled down really, and there are some dense trees and brush and whatnot that surrounded three sides of it. This woman comes out of the wooded area, and I immediately knew something wasn't right. You see, she was limping and she only had on one sandal, and frankly she looked like crap. She was pale and her face was gaunt. She was really, really pretty, but kind of looked exhausted. The thing that immediately caught my attention was her baby, who she was holding pretty tightly in her arms as she started to come towards us. I didn't really know what to do, but my boyfriend immediately got up and walked over to make sure that she was okay. I couldn't help but think all of these awful things might happen. After spending so many hours hearing the horror stories on Reddit, I was just terrified she would do something. My boyfriend is a lot more trusting than I am though, and he always has the first instinct of what's the problem and how can I help. He never assumed the bad in anybody. So, this woman is just sobbing by the time she gets to the porch of the condo, 
and she looks like she's just been through a war zone. She's shaking and hyperventilating and crying. She tells us that basically her boyfriend has been a drunk for a while, and he's been getting worse and worse, and he's been an overall abusive guy. He gets pissed whenever she was focusing on the baby instead of him, and part of what pissed him off was that it wasn't his kid, so he kind of just didn't care about the baby at all. She told us how this time in particular, he was drunk and she was driving him home with the baby in the back seat. And he grabbed the baby's booster seat and tore it out of the car and threw it out of the window while they were driving. She had got the baby out of the seat or something. I don't remember how because as she's telling us about how he started hitting her because she took the baby and ran. We hear this yelling. And we turn and see this angry dude walking up to the condo. And she starts losing it. Drunk and angry, this guy followed her to our condo and was starting to come up to us. He was trying to act like he wasn't upset. He was doing a, oh, you guys found her, thank you so much. Baby, let's go home. That kind of thing, but he was slurring his speech and not doing a good job of hiding how messed up he was. My boyfriend has always been a pacifist. Honestly, he's even kind of a pushover. He's really non-confrontational and tries to find a way to talk stuff out and come to an agreement before doing anything. But before I could even say anything, he's across the yard and approaching this guy. As much of a pacifist as he is, he's also huge. He's built like a football player. He's six foot three, and at the time, he was 230 pounds. I've known my boyfriend since we were 10. At the time, we were 20, and we had been dating for just over a year. I knew him better than anyone. He's never done anything like this before. But he goes up to this guy and goes, Not another step, dude. And he's shaking as he says it. The guy tries to walk around my boyfriend and goes, No, it's okay. I'm just going to take her home. And my boyfriend steps in front of him and shakes his head. You're drunk. So I'm going to pretend like maybe you didn't get what I just said. Don't come any closer. It's at this point the guy stops trying to pretend and he says something like, You don't know what's going on. That's my girlfriend and I'm going to take her home. And he tries rounding my boyfriend again. And one more time my boyfriend blocks him and goes, Stop. I've never heard this tone in his voice before or since. It was scary. It wasn't him. The guy tried one more time before my boyfriend finally put his hand on his chest and pushed him back a bit, keeping his hand on the guy's chest. I'm telling you right now, you're not going anywhere near that girl and her child, so turn around and walk away. This guy was about 5'6", maybe 5'7", so when he looked up to threaten my boyfriend, he had looked like a kid. The guy finally looks up at my boyfriend and he says something that I couldn't hear. My boyfriend said something back and then the guy stared at him for a moment, like he was deciding whether or not to do anything. My boyfriend finally pushed him away, and the guy stumbled back, and then started pointing at me and the girl as he was saying something, and then he started to walk away. I didn't learn till the next day, but the guy had told my boy that he had a gun, and that he was coming back, and that he would kill him and I if we stop him again. My boyfriend's response to this changes depending on who's telling the story. The origin he told me that he told the guy he would feed him his own teeth. Which made me laugh because he's such a dork and he got that from a movie. And ever since then, the line he tells everyone else is, I'll be waiting. The woman was sobbing. The baby was sobbing. And I was shaking because even though he didn't throw any punches or anything, I could tell that he was ready to hurt this guy if anything else had happened. We called the police and didn't really do much of anything outside of to make sure everyone was breathing and take the girl to her sister's place. We didn't really hear much from her after, but I know my boyfriend sent her an email once or twice, and she's married now to someone else and had another kid last time that they talked. It was a really nice trip, despite that part, and to fight my boy's dad got into with someone in his family. I also had Pimeo for the first time. I'm not sure how it's spelled, but it was pretty good.